1863 was such an important year in the history of the world. In America, where the Civil War was raging, slavery was abolished, and President Abraham Lincoln promised his country government of the people, by the people, for the people. In England, the first underground line was opened between Paddington and Farringdon. In Switzerland, the Red Cross was founded, and here, in France, this went on show and caused the biggest scandal the world of art had ever witnessed. Idiotic, wretched, shocking, incoherent, childish, raged the papers of the day, taking huge offence at Manet's déjeuner sur l'herbe, the picnic on the grass. They didn't like the nude, they didn't like the men, they didn't like the colour scheme, they didn't like the composition. What upset them most, though, was this provocative way in which the men in this picture were dressed, but she wasn't. Not only was this woman flagrantly naked, but, worse, she didn't give a damn. No, she just looked right back at her audience with that extraordinary stare of hers and dared them to disapprove. It was almost as if she was accusing them. Our own Dante Gabriel Rossetti, the pre-Raphaelite, would later write a horrified letter home about this French idiot named Manet, who must be the greatest and most uncritical ass who ever lived. <sighs> Nasty. They were all wrong, of course. People invariably are when they get all worked up about an artwork. But very few pictures can claim to have changed the course of art single-handedly. This, however, is one of them. I'll just spell it out for you. Without this picture, there wouldn't have been Impressionism. And without Impressionism, there wouldn't have been modern art. And we'll talk about all that. What Manny was trying to do here, what he achieved, why this thing had the impact it did. But on a more personal note, can I also question the eyesight of all those critics who, in 1863, found this woman ugly? Who complained about her figure and laughed at her? Were they all blind? This woman isn't ugly. This is one of the most desirable and alluring women in art. And when Manet found her, his art found a raison d'etre. Here she is, and her again. Who was she? You'll find out. The thing that, that uh, bothered people uh, with the déjeuner, I think, I think, I mean, from all this distance, is the look of that woman. There she sat on the lawn uh, with these men in their, you know, student garb, um, young men, and uh, she could care less. Well, that's outrageous. I think, I think that must have driven people, men who wrote about her, crazy. Manet was the son of a very rich and very prominent French judge. Auguste Manet, he was called. He was a holder of the Légion d'honneur, and here at the Palais de Justice, Manet Senior was at the top of the judge's tree and held one of the most important legal positions in France. His mother was a genuine blue blood. Her godfather was the King of Sweden, and in fact the current kings of Sweden are all descended from him. So with a father who presided over the Palais de Justice and a mother mixed up with royalty, Manet came from an unusually distinguished family. He was the eldest son, born in 1832, 
and as so often happened in such situations, his father hoped he'd continue the family tradition and become a lawyer, while Edouard himself dreamt of the opposite. He dreamt of becoming an artist. With Manet more than with most artists, the choice between respectability and rebellion was so very loaded. Manet chose rebellion. He signed up as an apprentice in the studio of a flashy and immensely popular academic painter called Thomas Couture, a peddler of huge, fleshy, pompous fantasies packed with ancient nudes. This one shows the day after the night before at a Roman orgy. It's soft porn done with oil paints, but because the girls were dressed, or rather undressed, as Romans, Couture was forgiven. In Manet's world, this was acceptable, but this was shocking. The Dejeuner sur Lab is just frankly provocative. It was obviously completely immoral for a modern dressed woman to be seating naked with two fully clothed men. If you had river gods and nymphs and so on, of course that was absolutely fine, but not people who were absolutely obviously explicitly contemporary in their clothes. Rather surprisingly, Manet's father accepted his son's decision to become an artist and generously provided the money for Manet's upkeep and education. It can't have been easy for August Manet to sponsor and fund his son's rebellion, and it certainly wasn't in character. So let me plant some seeds of suspicion here about his reasons for doing it. Perhaps August Manet wasn't as respectable as he pretended to be. Perhaps Edouard knew something about his father that the father didn't want others to know. Perhaps Manet Jr. had something on Manet Senior. This is Manet's wife, Suzanne Lehnhoff. When Manet was a teenager, this Suzanne, who was from Holland, joined the family as a piano teacher. She gave piano lessons to Manet and his brothers. Now, something very mysterious happened with Suzanne because in 1852, she gave birth to a baby. And this baby, a boy called Leon, went on to appear in many of Manet's pictures. And because Manet eventually married Suzanne 10 years later, it's always been assumed that Leon was Manet's son. But what if he wasn't? What if someone else were the father? What if someone else made Suzanne Lehnhoff pregnant? What disgrace this would have brought to the family if it had come out? Who among the Manets needed most to preserve an aura of respectability around himself? A lot of very convincing circumstantial evidence points to August Manet being the father of little Leon and not Edouard. And if he was, as I believe he was, then the painting of Dejeuner sur Lèbe, begun in the year of August Manet's death, would have been informed by a highly personal understanding of the shallowness of respectability and the power of lust and the prevalence of hypocrisy. Oh yes, I'm going to tell you everything that went into the making of this picture, but some of it you may not want to know. First thing to note about Dejeuner sur Lèbe is that the scene Manet is showing us is actually illegal. Men and women weren't allowed to bathe together in Manet's time, and they certainly weren't allowed to go naked in public. When they did go bathing in the river, they wore very proper swimming costumes and were separated by big wire fences. 
so everyone seeing Dejeuner would have known immediately that Manet was deliberately teasing the law, mocking it. And the person who would have known this more clearly than anyone else, had he still been alive to see it, would have been Manet's father. The most obviously and outrageously illegal participant in this outdoor orgy, which is what people would have thought they were looking at, was that wonderful nude who sits there on the left and stares out at us so implacably. I've already admitted how much I personally admire, oh, OK, I fancy, the naked woman in Dejeuner sur l'Herbe. Well, her name was Victorine Moran, and her story is fascinating. Victorine Moran was born in Paris, and uh, she lived uh, in a working-class neighborhood. I can't imagine her uh, just being a model. I think that uh, the passivity of modeling is not something that suits or goes with the, the look of that woman. Some dreadful stories exist of uh, Victorine. People seeing her outside the World's Fair, begging for money, or being drunk. Uh, for, for me, that was always a reading. You know how th these people knew her as Manet's model, which is fairly close to being a prostitute. And so then when they see her again, they read all of that into it and have her dead at, you know, uh, 50, practically. So when we learned that she was a painter, and exhibited at the Salon, and uh, even late in, in her 80s, when asked by someone doing a census what she did, and she identified herself as an artist, I think it was a vision she had of herself. So in a way, her life, I don't know, I suppose you could say her life was ordinary, but I, I find it rather extraordinary that, first of all, that this working class girl could have ever imagined herself an artist. How did she ever get the idea that that's what she could do? I love her for that. I do. I just love her. <laughs> Manet was supposed to have met Victorine at the Palais de Justice, where his father presided over the courts. Manet Senior's task was to rule on domestic affairs, patrimony suits, affairs of illegitimacy and inheritance. Victorine was a part-time model and a street singer, so she was exactly typical of the kind of women who were always being brought before Manet Senior, accused of enticing this man or that man. So there's a perfectly reasonable chance that Manet met Victorine while she was appearing before his father on some misdemeanor or other. What a splendid irony that is. I definitely think there was chemistry of a sexual kind between uh, Miron and Manet. Even if she were gay, which I think she was. He talks about going to a party and, uh, you know, Victorine being there with her girlfriend and uh, their arms around each other and so on. So, whereas I never used to think of the two of them uh, sexually engaged, I think they could have been sexually engaged without ever having sex, let me put it that way. It's inevitably been whispered that Manet fell in love with Victorine, and certainly her looks did something to him as they do to me. He painted her obsessively and gloriously for a decade. Here she is in a matador's costume Manet had made specially for him by a Spanish tailor in Paris. This is her as a street singer leaving work. And here as a lady of the night who's just said goodbye to her respectable and two-faced Parisian lover. How do we know he's respectable and two-faced? Because, brilliantly, Manet's given Victorine a monocle to brandish. It can't be her monocle. Women didn't wear them. Old men whose eyesight was going wore monocles. Old men whose eyesight was going kept mistresses on the side. 
They sent posies of flowers to indicate they were coming. They feigned respectability in the daytime and then searched out what they really wanted at night. This is Manet's other famously scandalous picture. Olympia, she's called. It's Victorine again, so lovely, so brazen. What's happening in this picture is that Olympia, a courtesan, is greeting her next client, me, or you, or whoever's looking at the picture, because we've just arrived and we've brought her a bouquet of flowers. Just look at the expression on Victorine's face. What thoughtfulness, what sadness, what pity. And here's an interesting detail. See this bracelet? It's apparently a bracelet that Manet gave to his wife, and inside it was a lock of his hair. Now, what to make of that? I'm not sure. But I think it underlines how Manet's art becomes extra personal in matters of sexual desire and respectability and the keeping of mistresses. And I think we have to bear that in mind when we go outside again and take a closer look at Déjeuner sur l'herbe. There was a lot of anxiety about the morality of women in Paris in the 1860s. What people were most afraid of was the sense that you couldn't tell who people were. You couldn't tell the difference between respectable people and non-respectable people. So all the way there was a sense that you couldn't read modern woman. So here's Victorine Mouron, naked, brazen, a biche, a lorette, a prostitute. And opposite her, lounging about, is Manet's brother, Gustave, who's playing an art student in the picture. We know he's supposed to be an art student because he's wearing a silly hat, a type of indoor fez much favoured by students. The second man is Manet's brother-in-law, Ferdinand Lehnhoff, the brother of Suzanne Lehnhoff. Ferdinand was a sculptor, so these are real-life artistic types pretending to be fictional artistic types and flouting the law orgiastically in a studenty way. The question is, why? Manet's told us that the original inspiration for the Déjeuner was a terribly famous painting that hangs in the Louvre of a concert champêtre, an outdoor music party involving a pair of costumed musicians and a pair of naked muses. In Manet's time, the painter of this old masterish Ménage à Quatre was believed to be the great Giorgione. More recently, Titian is said to have done it. Whichever of the two it was, the mood is luxurious, sensual, Venetian and very decadent. Two men who are dressed frolic with two muses who aren't. Not surprisingly, this great painting has set many French imaginations racing. The actual composition of Déjeuner sur l'herbe was based on a print by Marcantonio Raimondi of Raphael's Judgment of Paradise. So Manet's deliberately misquoting the old masters, taking on Raphael, taking on Giorgione, revisiting their scenarios and updating them. Déjeuner sur l'herbe shows us what Giorgione's concert champette would have looked like if it had taken place by the Seine in 1863, rather than somewhere golden in Arcadia in the 16th century. It would have looked ridiculous, uncomfortable and illegal. Thus, this naughty painting is an outrageous updating of the past, filled with deliberate shocks. For instance, what is that woman at the back actually doing? In Giorgione's concert Champetre, she's a lovely mythological muse, drawing a carafe of water from a sacred well. In Manet's painting, 
she's become a woman in a shift who's waded into the river and who cups the water with her hand. Now, I don't know if you've ever been on a beach with some French women. If you have, you'll know that they keep running into the water to have a pee. It's an unfortunate national habit. For the French, the entire Mediterranean is a giant outdoor bee day. And anyone looking at Manet's painting in the 19th century would have realised that Giorgione's water-bearing muse has become a woman having a pee. This deliberate sacrilege continues all around the picture. Look how sloppily the remains of the picnic have been dumped on the grass. See in the corner, there's a frog skulking in the grass. A frog, gone we oui in French, was student slang for a prostitute. So this picture hasn't just set out to update one of the great themes of the old masters, the outdoor concert. It's set out to have a laugh at the old master's expense. To rub our noses in the absurdity of what the old masters showed us. Look up there in the middle. Can you see it? It's something people usually miss. It's a bullfinch, a common bird of the parks, yet look how uncommonly it's flying here, with its wings stretched out like that, flying over the centre of the composition. There's only one other bird in art that flies like that, right there in the middle, the sacred dove that represents the Holy Ghost in so many Renaissance baptisms. So we have here a flying bullfinch replacing the Holy Ghost and coming down to a woman having a pee. This isn't just a deliberately shocking picture, it's also a deliberately sacrilegious one, a picture hell-bent on transgression by an artist who's lost his submissive respect for the past and who's deliberately elbowing the old masters out of the frame and replacing them with the harsh truths of the modern world. It takes great arrogance to paint a picture like this. It takes chutzpah and Frenchness. But above all, I suggest, it takes an intense sense of personal disappointment, of being let down by the past, of no longer believing in a world you thought you could trust. And Manet had good reason to feel like that.